So everybody, welcome to my talk about the economics of vendor neutrality and vendor domination. Let me uh, figure out where I'm at and then we'll get a move on it. So this is the topic of my master's thesis that I turned in a couple of months ago. I just graduated from my master's. So I'll be going into uh, the depths of the economics, um, what makes open source tick economically. And then I'll be talking about, um, based on that, uh, explaining what makes a project vendor neutral or vendor dominated and exploring some of the ways we can measure vendor neutrality or vendor domination. If you're not already, please don't forget to join us in the uh, Slack channel. The community channel is a great place to start, but there's also many other topic area groups that you guys might be interested in or that y'all might be interested in. Allow me to introduce myself. My name is Merle Kranz. I'm a former board member of the ASF. I was the conference chair for ApacheCon Berlin in 2019, last year, when we were still doing in-person events. I'm currently the treasurer of the Apache Software Foundation, and I'm also a software engineer and individual contributor to several human humanitarian uh, free and open source projects. For example, Apache Finract. I've also made minor contributions to OpenMRS and Makito. And I just graduated from my MBA program in Cologne, and I'm currently on the job market. So if you're looking for an open source expert, do ping me. Before I start, I do also want to thank the people who helped me with this work. This, is, uh, this was based on a 60-page paper. My thesis advisor, Professor Dr. Christoph Rosenkranz, uh, my early proofreader, Shane Kirkru, thank you. The guy who gave me the idea for the topic, who asked to remain anonymous, my mentor at the ASF, Greg Stein, and my support at home, my husband, Christoph Kranz, thank you all so very much. But my mistakes are my own, so don't blame them. So let's cover the economics of open source first. We'll go through the basics. First off, what is a public good? A public good is non-rivalrous. Non-rivalrous means that when one person benefits from it, the total value is not reduced. So software can be copied without reducing the initial value. A public good is also non-excludable. It's not possible to prevent others from benefiting from a public good. If it were excludable, then it would be a club good like a membership or you know, a golf, golf club entrance. Open source software is a public good. Well, how do we know it's a public good? Well, we can intuit it based on this, but we can also examine the economics of open source participation a little more closely. Baldwin and Clark in 2006 determined that open source is a strong link game. Well, what is a strong link game? Well, most people are more familiar with so-called weak link games, such as the prisoner's dilemma. So in a weak link game, the person who contributes the least or who is the most selfish determines the outcome for all of the participants. In a strong link game, the person who is the most generous determines the, the outcome for all of the participants. To see this, we can look at the Nash equilibrium when two open source software developers come together when they meet. The Nash equilibrium is basically one person defined by the, the x-axis decides um, whether they want to work or not work. And the other person defined by the y-axis also decides whether they work or don't work. And they, each of them is going to be considering what the other person will do in order to make this decision and what their value will be depending on what they do and what the other person does. So if we look at what the open source software developer is going to do, well, each of them is going to look at this. Software developer one is gonna look at this and say, well, if I don't work, I could either have nothing or I could have the value from what the other person will do. If I do work, then I'll definitely have something. Each software developer will look at this and make this determination. And if they're being rational, they will decide to work. Now, if they both decide to work, then the value they have 
will be the value of the product of, of, of what they produce and subtracted from that the cost of the work that they put into it. So the Nash equilibrium in this case will bring them both into the lower right corner here in which both of them, if they don't coordinate, in which both of them have the value of the work product minus the cost of the work. And if the cost of the work is lower than the value of the work product, then both of them will do the work. Now, if they coordinate, then they might divide up the work. They might find modules or units on which each of them could work. What's more is if they then go and accidentally, because they didn't coordinate perfectly, accidentally work on the same thing, they still have an advantage. So let's say that both of them decided independently that feature XYZ is the thing that they need the most. And they go off and they implement it, and each of them comes back with a different implementation. Well, we all know from software development that different feature implementations have different values. Maybe one is a little faster, maybe it has a few less bugs. Now, when both of them come back and say, hey, look at this work, then they have to decide which implementation they're going to take. Which implementation they decide to take will be decided by the PMC. So let me make that a little bigger. The PMC is going to look at the value of each of these implementations and then decide which implementation to take. The value then of the decision will be the value of the PMC decision minus the cost to that individual developer of that particular implementation. The cost will also be different. What that means is that the PMC will most likely go in and say which one is worth more. And so each developer will get the maximum value of the two, develop the two possible solutions together. And this means that both of them actually have an advantage because they will be maximizing their value. In some cases, the advantage might be slight, but in both cases, they are better off because they have more options. This is what is known as option theory. So we've been talking about contributions. Most people, when they say, when I say contributions, think of lines of code. Of course, there are many, many more kinds of contributions. What is a contribution? It's anything that adds incremental value to a project. It's organizing events, it's creating a project graphic, it's handling a project's visual, uh, social media presence. There are many, many, many things that are contributions to open source in an economic sense. Anything that creates value for the participants of that project. So what else is open source? Open source is a two-sided marketplace. And this is one of the insights that I came to um, in the master's thesis process. A two-sided marketplace is a special kind of marketplace in which the socially op more optimal platform prices do not sum to marginal costs. Now, some examples of two-sided marketplaces that you may already be aware of are the internet. So, there are people creating websites and people consuming websites, and those are the two sides of that marketplace. Um, payment networks like MasterCard or Visa, there are customers making payments, there are merchants accepting payments. And what happens in two-sided marketplaces is often the costs are distributed sometimes in unintuitive ways because you're trying to attract people into the market in order to create the network effects that, make, that, that create benefits for everybody. The value to the participants exceeds the cost of participation to those participants via these cross-platform network effects, which results in a virtuous cycle. So open source is a two-sided marketplace. What are the sides of this two-sided marketplace? Well, let's start with what the platform is. Here, the platform is the open source project hosted by an open source foundation. One side is the contributors, contributing uh, lines of code, event organization, the various things that contributors contribute into the project. Out of the project come release artifacts, and those release artifacts are consumed by users. So users are, are, are taking advantage of the contributors. Well, why do the contributors then contribute? Well, contributors generally contribute because they're being paid by a vendor. Now, that vendor may be their own uh, their own entrepreneurship, their own consulting company, 
but they are they are generally earning money or at least reputation in some way from their contributions to open source. Well, why do the vendors pay them? Well, the vendors pay them because the users pay the vendors. In some cases, indirectly. In some cases, the user, and in fact, in many cases, the user may in fact be the contributor um, or another programmer. And there's a the product which is then uh, delivered to an end user who actually pays. So this is somewhat simplified. However, the, the general concept is correct that, um, that a user is using the software and paying in some way, either through ad fix or subscription fees um, or paying for consulting, paying the vendor in some way, and then the vendor pays the contributors. What's more is you'll see that the contributors are somewhat grouped by the vendors. There are multiple contributors possibly being paid by one vendor and other contributors being paid by another vendor. And this grouping will become uh, interesting when we get to the next step in this, in, in this definitional process. So what are the benefits to the vendors? Why do vendors then pay contributors to work on open source? Well, for one thing, they can earn money with it. How do they earn money with it? Well, they might compose products out of it. They might create hosted offerings, for example, of, of uh, database products. They might create add-ons, monitoring tools, for example. They might offer consulting. They might offer training. There are many, many ways to earn money with an open source project. And which way they want to earn money also influences their relationship to the open source project. One way in which a a vendor might wish to have a relationship with an open source project is because they want architectural influence. Architectural influence means that they can move the direction in which the, the features or the bug fixes or um, other aspects of the, of the code itself in which those, those things are, are developed or produced. So if we go back to option theory, and think about the value of the various solutions. When, when multiple developers or multiple contributors come back with several solutions to the same problem, how does a PMC decide which solution to accept? Well, before we, we pretended, and it's not true, before we pretended that the value for one solution is universal. That is, if a, if a contributor comes with a single solution, the value of that solution is the same to that contributor as it is to all of the other contributors. However, there are cases in which that is not true. So for example, one contributor might be more interested in speed and another contributor might be more interested in customizability. One contributor might be more interested in the stability of the project and another might be more interested in innovation and pushing the envelope. Somebody might be more interested in features Another might be more interested in ease of use. And oftentimes, these things stand in conflict. Now, we do try to find solutions in which, uh, in which both values can be advanced. But it's not a perfect world. And there are often decisions that we have to make based on values. So how does the PMC decide? Well, they can't maximize because different users will have different values. And there are many things they could do. So for example, they might figure out this solution has negative value for some users. So we'll strike that, maybe because it creates API incompatibilities. Or they might say, we look for the solution that has the, the largest net social value. That is, it creates the most value for the largest number of users. Different PMCs are going to make that decision different ways. And how they decide which, which approach to take to that solution will be determined by who's on the PMC, what values they have. Now that brings us back to the question of who is on the PMC. As we noted in a previous slide, sometimes the PMC has more or less individuals from a certain vendor, and that might then make a difference into how this decision is made. Some evaluation strategies available as I mentioned earlier, the architecture which produces the largest net value um, or the largest amount of value for potential users. I'm not gonna go through this again in too much detail, but you can come back to it if you're interested. 
So these decisions have consequences. Which option evaluation strategy a PMC prefers will also determine who uses the code. And because it determines who uses the code, it will determine who contributes to the code. And because it determines who contributes to the code, it will also determine who the PMC wants on their project. It influences the entire community funnel into this project. What else might a vendor, what, whether, what other benefit might a vendor have from associating with an open source project? Well, one is brand association. This might be less interesting for composed products um, and add-ons, but more interesting or useful for consultants or hosted offerings. So what does brand association mean? Well, there are right ways to do brand association. For example, a product, a, a vendor can go and say, this is powered by Apache Hadoop or Apache Cassandra or Apache Spark. This is a product built on top of this, or this is a, a, an offering of a hosted version of an Apache product. Not taking credit for it, but saying we are offering this. And there's also a wrong way to do brand association. So you could say, for example, we are the original developers of Apache Foo Bar. We did all the work, really. Or this is a commercial distribution, a professional distribution of Apache Foo Bar, or even replace the Apache with the vendor's name and say, this is Acme Foo Bar. All of these corrupt the, the, the relationship between a, a community's brand and, and that community. The PMC is responsible for helping vendors to stay on the light side of the marketing force and not slip into these mistakes. But whether or not a PMC executes in those responsibilities will depend on who's on the PMC and what they value. Another reason why a vendor might choose to participate in an open source project is because um, it gives them the opportunity to influence the community. So why influence the community? Well, we already determined that influencing the brand can be beneficial to a project. Well, if you influence the community, then you can also influence decisions about protecting the brand. We already also determined that influencing the acceptance or the rejection of contributions can have value for a vendor. So if you influence the community, you can also influence decisions about accepting and rejecting contributions. So if you can, so, so those decisions about community composition have wide reaching consequences. And this is why many projects or many, many vendors try to get people into a PMC. Now, what does that do? It then makes it possible for the vendor to extract, to produce more value, hopefully for users, and then to extract more value from the users and then pass that value on to the contributors. In a vendor neutral decision making process, the decisions here about community composition, brand, or about contributions are made based on the value to users. And this is the definition of vendor neutrality. A vendor neutral open source project is one in which the community accepts or rejects proposed contributions and proposed changes in community composition based on the predicted value of those changes to the users, rather than their predicted value to specific vendors. Vendor domination, on the other hand, replaces the value to users in that decision-making process with the value to vendors. In this case, the vendors who have contributors on the PMC will be making decisions based solely on their advantage and not on the advantage to the users as a whole. So in, as an example as to how vendors would, would influence decisions about contributions, um, a contributor submits a feature which competes with a feature in the next release of a vendor's premium version. The feature is never integrated and the contributor receives no feedback or a contributor submits a bug fix necessary to support hardware, which competes with the hardware produced by a dominant vendor. Code reviewers employed by the dominant vendor 
nitpick minor points of style until the contributor abandons the submission. So these would be negative examples. Neutrality means that proposed changes are evaluated based on the value to users. As an example on brand, a vendor might publish a free version of its product, which contains upgrade hooks to a commercial version sold by the vendor, and then calls it by the name of the open source project. The PMC then ignores this. This would be an example in which the PMC is not protecting the brand. Or let's say a vendor claims in its marketing materials that the core contributors for an open source project all work for them. The PMC might even go so far as to publish supporting claims on the open source project's website. These are all examples in which a vendor is dominating a project. Neutrality means that trademarks and brands are owned and enforced by the PMC. And finally, the community, which influences the, the other areas um, indirectly. Neutrality means that the PMC members represent the users who benefit from the project. Counterexamples would be the PMC members vote to offer the role of committer to the new hire of a dominant vendor while ignoring other deserving contributors. Or the PMC defines promotable contributions to closely match the profile of employees of a dominant vendor. And this is one reason why I get very suspicious when, when uh, PMCs start trying to define promotable contributions to be only code, because this excludes people making contributions in the form of community organization that uh, might be coming from other vendors. <clears throat> so what are the results of vendor domination? What are the consequences? Well, one thing that could happen is people leave. If people are, don't feel like their contributions are valued uh, or even accepted, then they will eventually give up or just not come. If people look at a project and from the outside and say, we don't believe that this project is vendor neutral, then they might just never decide to take the risk of contributing code or trying to contribute code. A project might fork. So let's say vendor domination occurs after people have joined a project and they find that their contributions are not being accepted they might just fork the project and go elsewhere. This can also happen. Now, this isn't just a consequence of vendor domination. This can also happen just because uh, people have different values and need to go in different directions. And that's OK. However, if, uh, if it's a minority or a minority value um, that's dominating a project, then the project fork can be harmful to the original the home of the project, the original project community. And harmful means then that the net social benefit declines because people aren't collaborating anymore. People aren't coming in and benefiting from the strong link game in which everybody says, hey, I'll share yours, you share mine. And we all have more because people aren't working together anymore. So how do we prevent vendor domination? Well, first we have to identify it. So how do we measure vendor domination? Now, if we look back at the model here, then we'll determine that probably the easiest part of this to measure is decisions about accepting and rejecting contributions. That's because these are the decisions that are made the most frequently. Hundreds of decisions per month, possibly even hundreds per week are made. And the data about who is making these, these uh, contributions and who is making the decisions is readily available. So what data do we need? One thing we need is uh, the pull request data. This is available via GitHub. We also need the PMC membership. The PMC membership list is available via the Apache Software Foundation website in the case of Apache projects. And we need employment data. And employment data is often available via LinkedIn, certainly often enough to cover 80 to 90% of the contributors. Now from this data, we can then derive is a vendor well represented on the PMC. And for this, I've defined well represented as uh, this vendor has three members or more. Uh, there's also a possibility that a vendor might be majority represented on the PMC, although I didn't study any cases in which that was, that was true. 
there's just represented, which means one or two uh, PMC members associated with a particular vendor. There's not represented, which means none. And then there's there's people whose vendor, whose, whose employer is unknown. So it is a contribution from an, a, from an employee of a well-represented vendor. We then look at the pull request, we correlate it to the person who submitted it, and correlate that to, the, to their employer on LinkedIn. And uh, what is the correlation between pull request acceptance and vendor representation? So if you uh, look at the URL there, I wrote a first fairly primitive, this is first draft, primitive tool to draw down the, the pull request data from GitHub and match it up with the PMC data. And I put in the, the footwork to go to two different projects and pull down their PMC membership and the employers of all of the people who, who submitted pull requests within a certain time period and all of the people on the PMC. So the first example here is Apache Airflow. And if we look at this, we see that there's a negative correlation between people whose employer status is unknown um, and whether or not their contribution was accepted. And we see that there's a slight positive correlation between people whose employer status is well represented and uh, their, their submission was accepted. Now, what we don't see in this particular data is any starvations. So clearly Apache's, so a starvation is when a contribution is left um, open for a month or more. And the reason we don't see any, any starvations here is because the time period that I was able to to capture was shorter than a month. Why was it shorter than a month? Well, in order to uh, keep the data about employer and community stable, I used the period from uh, the last community change, the last PMC member admission, to the time period when I pulled down the data. And I pulled the data down on July 29th. So it was like three weeks, uh, which means that I couldn't study starvations in this data set. Now, um, what we see also is that people who are well represented are less likely to have, uh, have pull requests that remain open. They're also less likely to have pull requests get rejected. Um, people who are represented, it seems to be about even as to whether, like roughly, as to whether or not their pull requests are accepted um, or rejected. And people who are not represented, uh, whose employer is not representative, uh, their pull request is more likely to still be open. Um, it's also more likely to be rejected and there's a negative correlation to, to acceptance. So these are indications and uh, vendor domination versus vendor neutrality is not a black or white, it's a continuum. So these are indications that uh, Apache Airflow is somewhere on the, the continuum between vendor domination and vendor neutrality. It's not perfectly neutral. None of these projects are going to be perfectly neutral. So Apache Cassandra is one where I was able to capture a slightly longer period. And here we'll see, because I captured a longer period, we'll see some starvations. Um, in this case, it was 128 pull requests between April 29th and July 29th. Um, for, and you can see, I'm not gonna read the data out loud to you, but you can see that the data are, are rather similar to Apache Airflow. There are correlations between um, people being unrepresented um, and having their, their contributions starved or well represented. And th in this case, actually, the correlations are somewhat smaller, which is an indication that Apache Cassandra is currently possibly uh, more vendor neutral than Apache Airflow, which would make sense because Apache Airflow is a somewhat newer project and Cassandra is an older project. Um, now, one thing that, that's interesting if you look at this data is that Apache Cassandra, if you just look at the number of people working for a certain employer, Apache Cassandra looks like it's more vendor dominated. There's lots of people at a Cassandra working for data stacks and Apple. Um, but if you then start looking at the way this seems to affect how pull requests are accepted or rejected, Apache Cassandra actually looks more neutral. So it's important to notice that the number of people on a PMC from a certain vendor is not alone an indicator of vendor domination or vendor neutrality. So what are the next steps? Well, it would be great to draw some comparison data, especially Apache Cassandra had an incident in 2016 where it was judged by the 
or to be vendor dominated, it would be good to go and pull down the data from that period and compare it to the data from this period and see if uh, this indicates vendor domination as a way to test this measure. We could also try out pull request weightings. So for example, um, to, to weight a pull request by the, the code line count. Currently, I'm just doing one pull request has the same value as any other pull request, whether it's two lines or 200 lines. Um, it would also be great to draw data from our projects. It does require a lot of footwork to, to pull down the vendor for, for each of the contributors. And then it would be great to also test the correlation between current um, project community and newly announced PMC members. So maybe uh, PMC members are more likely, new PMC members are more likely to come from uh, vendors who are already participating via other PMC members in the project. So that has me coming up on the end here. Does anybody have any questions? Let me look through the, the chat. So Lawrence Hatched Architectural Influence is why companies get involved with the CNCF projects. Yes, definitely. What architectural influence companies, let's see. I don't think that's a question directed at me. Practically, some companies believe they can oops, can exclude competitors by using uh, the cloud native um, computing foundation. Have you talked to the people involved with chaos? Yes, but not in depth. Actually, this would be something I, I would love to do and connect up with them because they have more data. <clears throat> um, and I, Rich points out that this is related to what Kibble's doing. Uh, yes, uh, I'm actually a subscriber to the Kibble list. I wasn't, this is this is really basic compared to what Kibble's doing. I was working more on a theoretical level than on, than on the data level, but moving into the analysis phase, it really should be drawn into Kibble. Oh, Sharon asked the same things. So any other questions? All right, then I'm done a little early. Oh wait, Thomas has another question. Should we take into account correlation between quality of the PR? Well, that's a good question. How are we gonna judge quality of the PR? I was trying to stay away from things that are, um, that are not objective. From, so, so the quality of a PR might be, uh, let's see, Lawrence says there are ways to do it but you don't want to try, all right? <laughs> yeah, all right. So if you guys want to continue the conversation, I will be in the community channel in Slack. And thank you very much. Uh, I very much enjoyed presenting to you. And have a great day. <laughs>